Good evening. Every British Columbia hopes that there is still some light at the end of the tunnel as we face up to yet another session on this disastrous strike in the IWA in British Columbia. And that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight off the top. And here's Steve with a rundown. Bowen Island takes on prehistoric proportions to bring a woman named Ayla to life. She is the woman for all ages in the clan of the cave bear. She is returning in the sequel, The Mammoth Hunters, and her creator, Gene All, is coming up with Webster. But first, how long can the lumber industry remain shut down before everyone suffers? The union has angrily rejected the latest recommendations for a solution. Tonight, The Employer's View, with Keith Bennett of Forest Industrial Relations. Now, Keith, uh, we've done this so often, we've got to use a first name basis now between yourself, me, and Monroe, Jack. But Monroe sat here last night, having only had the report a few hours, and said it's a disaster, and the entire union negotiation committee has recommended total rejection of the Hodgson report. Then same day you say that you reluctantly accept it. Now what made you accept it while Monroe's turning it down out of hand? Well first of all Jack there are parts of this report that we don't like either. Uh, they didn't address one of the key issues that we had uh, in the negotiations and that is the add-on compensation systems. They've given the IWA a better pension plan than what the pulp industry settled for earlier this year. Uh, there's quite a number of areas of that plan, and, and on, in the question of restrictive contracting language and logging, that's what the report has recommended. So there are areas of that report that we were unhappy with. But I think this strike's gone on long enough. I think, uh, and our people feel the same way. We believe it's time to get this industry back to work. We believe it's, uh, there's an opportunity to get our employees back uh, before Christmas. And uh, we frankly have reluctantly agreed to recommend this to our, our membership, which we'll do on Thursday morning. Uh, but the, the reason behind it is we, we've got to get this industry working again. The strike's gone on too long. Jim. All right, Monroe tells me he's, uh, that the union is only going to vote those members who are on strike. Are you only going to vote those members of FIR who have stuck solidly with the FIR position, or are you going to vote those two who have made deals on the side and continued to work? We will be voting our total membership, including those that made the so-called wink-wink, nudge-nudge deals. When will you have your formal result accepting it, if that's what happens? We will be voting at 10.30 on a Thursday morning, and I would think the result should be known by noon or soon after. Are you very hopeful in view of the a statement by the IWA executive recommending total rejection. Do you think they might accept it still? Our people? No, the their union? people. The union? I don't know. The, uh, the IWA has a record of voting along with the recommendations of their negotiating committee. Uh, the only thing that I would say, Jack, is that, that if there are people in the IWA that feel strongly about having had enough and wanting to go back to work, they shouldn't let somebody else vote on their behalf. They should get out and vote. And uh, if they want to follow the recommendations of their committee, that's okay, but they should vote. Let's go through and see, take it, if I take it from the union point of view, see what you got and what did you get, which is somewhat acceptable to you on the Hodgson Report. First of all, the general wage increase of 40 cents an hour started the second year of the term. Why is that in? I thought you were both going for a one-year contract. Well, we were initially, Jack. Uh, we, were, we got talking about a long-term study with an industrial inquiry commission. We even got talking about a royal commission at one time. It didn't make any point in having a two-year agreement if the commission was going to report uh, before the first year of the agreement had expired. But uh, no, as far as term is concerned, we're satisfied with the two-year agreement. Uh, the 40 cents we're a little unhappy with. Uh, uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, wage settlement for the pulp industry in their second year, but the pulp unions uh, earned their 40 cents, and the I by giving the industry more operating time, uh, the IWA hasn't given us anything, and that that 40 cents, along with the cost of the pension improvement in there, we're looking at somewhere between 60 and 70 cents an hour increase to our industry, at a time when when we shouldn't be increasing our okay. labor costs. If this were to go through, the IWA would get pensions, full pensions at 60 instead of 65, $25 per month per year of service. Mind you, you had already agreed to that in the preliminary negotiations. Well, we had offered that, Jack. We had offered yeah. th that uh, back in the middle of July, and it was rejected by the IWA. And it may not be right, but the way you negotiate is if someone rejects what you've offered, that's no longer on the table. 
Let's look at the next recommendations on really on the hours of work. You would get straight time production work on Saturdays. That's what you wanted, wasn't in, it? In manufacturing, no, we didn't get what we wanted in manufacturing. Well, let's talk about manufacturing. All right, we have a very limited uh, um, improvement in manufacturing in that we will be able to schedule a Saturday production shift at straight time uh, for balancing purposes. Now, what that means is that uh, if we have uh, need for additional dry veneer, then what we've done in the past is we brought in university students and high school students uh, in order to feed the, the uh, dryers. We've had to pay them a rate and a half or on, on an eight-hour basis. We'll be able to pay them straight time. So you got some slight improvement in straight time production work on Saturdays to correct production imbalances. Right. Right? Right. Now, what about logging flexibility? You're getting straight time seven days a week up to 10 hours a day and no more than 40 hours a week. Is that not a big step forward for you? Well, certainly that's the trade-off, Jack. Uh, we have been telling anybody and everybody that will listen, including the IWA, that if you are going to restrict our ability to introduce contractors into our operations, where we get the resulting cost efficiencies and cost reductions of introducing contractors, then on the other side, you must then give us more flexibility to schedule our own people. And uh, that, that section of the report is positive from our point of view. Seven days a week, logging, straight time, no more than 10 hours a day and not more than 40 hours a week. Well, that sounds very brutal, so, but let's, let's take a look at what's going on now and has been going on for quite a number of years. We have had the ability, and many of the isolated camps, they are working 10 days straight and four days off, 15 days straight uh, or six days off. What this does give us, it gives us the ability to make better use of, this, of, our, of our equipment. And we'll be able to schedule that equipment to run seven days a week, but we're not, we're not contemplating... Running uh, everybody. Yeah, asking the crews to work seven days a week, ten hours a day. We're not, we're not, even, not even thinking about that. But we do have the opportunity with certain shift schedules to have people working four days a week at ten hours a day with another crew coming in First crew takes four days off, the second crew t works four tens. We can keep our equipment running full time, and that's a significant <coughs> part of this report, as you'll notice. That's really why you want, that you reluctantly recommend its acceptance. Yes, that is the trade off. For instance, if the Commission had recommended the restrictive contracting language that they've got in the report without giving us the quid pro quo of the flexibility of shift scheduling, we would have turned that report down. And now you're now talking about contracting out, and you say that this clause here, employers should not be allowed to contract out logging work beyond past and current practices, except in special circumstances, that gives you nothing. Well, that gives the IWA what they've been seeking, which is restrictive contracting language. That you freezes the horse race, Jack. If what that says to us, and uh, we've clarified it uh, with Dr. Peter Pierce on the intention of that, what that says is if you have been doing it, you can continue to do it, but you cannot continue to do what you've been doing. That is, no more additional contracting. We're frozen at that level. I want to get that quite clear. You're saying that this meets the IWA's demand to freeze contracting out and logging the way they wanted it frozen. Absolutely. Your quid pro quo is the logging flexibility. Right. Uh, straight time, you see, is not a full straight time in manufacturing through Saturdays, but merely to correct imbalance. Yeah, the only shifts that we would run on Saturdays in manufacturing would be those shifts, and, mm -hmm. and normally it's a, it's a drier shift or a planer shift to balance production, and um, we would be, we would be uh, using uh, casuals, part-time employees. And the IWA also, uh, in the report anyway, is that maintenance can be done at straight time on Saturdays up to 12 hours a day. Right. Well, that's in response to the IWA's desire to eliminate our weekend overload contracting. Uh, they wouldn't allow us to schedule people on Sunday. We had to bring in contractors to do that. And uh, the Commission has listened to the argument and said, well, the employer, in order to, to meet that problem with the IWA, should be, able to al should be allowed to schedule their maintenance crews on Your Sunday. Your own maintenance crews? Our own maintenance On Saturday at straight time? They would be scheduled Saturday at straight time and Sunday at time and a half. Okay, one last thing. Where did this $200 signing bonus come from and does it mean anything at all on the possible settlement of the dispute? Well, no, it was a surprise to us, uh, Jack. Uh, we've never even talked about it. As a matter of fact, the, the logic of paying people $200 to come back off of a strike which they voluntarily went on frankly escapes me. I, I, I don't know what the logic of the $200 is. 
Go on to the phones with Keith Bennett. I want to talk to you a little bit about the economic aspects of the industry as outlined by Pierce after the break. <laughs> To Keith Bennett of FIR, it's easy to understand, if I were a union man, my nervousness about the future. About 20,000 fewer men in the lumber and uh, logging industry in British Columbia in the past few years, and all the technological pro progress, but did the economic survey give your side any support on this, on contracting out? One done by Peter Pierce. Well, I think that P Dr. Pierce has written an excellent summary on the economic condition of our industry and what we're facing. Uh, he points out a number of things in his report. Uh, he talks about the outlook being highly uncertain. He talks about uh, the threat of countervailing duties or, or export taxes or increased dumpage or whatever it is. He talks about the fact that our competitors pay lower wages. He talks about the fact that uh, the operators in the Pacific Northwest have been successful in getting both flexibility and negotiating reductions in their, in their costs. He does, a, he does a, an excellent analysis, in our view, of the outlook in the industry uh, for the for the certain. But well, they did it by, in some occasions, actually breaking the unions, and that has not happened, and not as it likely to happen in British Columbia, is it? Well, no, we're not talking about breaking the union, and there's only one employer across the line who actually broke the union. But uh, the warehousers and the Simpsons, uh, the major competitors across the line, they've been successful in negotiating uh, uh, reductions right. in total labor costs. If this doesn't solve it, and Van der Zand, the Premier, says he's not about to legislate anybody back to work, is there anything else in the Labor Code that can be used to batch the parties' heads together? No, Jack, that's the unfortunate part of it. Um, we've exhausted all of the initiatives that you can take under the Labor Code. Uh, we've tried to negotiate it face to face. We've tried to negotiate it in many meetings. Um, the Premier has indicated that he has no intentions of legislating uh, this industry back to work or legislating a settlement. So if the IWA membership rejects this uh, commission report, Jack, the strike's just going to go on. There, there's no end to it. There is no way of bringing an end to it. It's mm -hmm. just going to go on. Let's go to the phones. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. Uh, I'm an IWA member from New West, and tomorrow, or Monday when we vote, I'm going to vote no on this contract. Uh, we've got less than what we started with. The $200 is a joke thing to go back, and they've really given us nothing on contracting out of maintenance crews. Is there going to be any of us around in the second year to collect the 40 cent raise, which I also feel is a joke? That's my comment, thanks. Okay. Well, I think that on the, the maintenance crew, um, significantly, the uh, Commission has recommended that we should be able to schedule our maintenance people now on, on Sundays, um, and that would mean to me that there will be less overload contractors and more company maintenance employees. Go ahead from Albany. Yes, I'd like to say something about the scheduling of hours for loggers. Um, right now, we get about a 21-day average per month. When you schedule the four days on, four days off, we'll get about 16 days per month. That's a 24% loss in wages alone, and that's a, I can see it from the employer's point of view because that's a 43% um, gain in productivity. But it's also, uh, I work for a contractor, a union contractor, uh, we would, we're stuck on a quota, which means we'll get that quota 43% faster, so we're going to lose 43% of our work here just from that alone. Just a minute, can you understand that? I yes, don't, no, no, don't understand no, it. no, I understand what he's saying. Um, well, let's deal with the quota. I think that's important. Um, our intention is not to, to, um, to uh, harvest our allowable cut in a very short period of time, send all of our employees on UIC, and then put our equipment in a garage and let it sit there. Our intent is precisely the opposite. What we want to do is we want to use our equipment to, over a longer period of time, to get the allowable cut in. Now, I, th there, there could possibly be fewer employer employees over a long period of time, Jack. But at the, uh, at the outset, what we must do is take this highly, highly expensive equipment and we must operate it on a full-time basis. That's the only way we're going to bring our costs down. We don't see reducing the number of employees, certainly in the short term. 
But as technological change comes into our industry, as more of this expensive equipment comes into the industry, then certainly we must work at seven days a week. Fair enough. Go ahead from Black Creek. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm an IWA member working in logging, and uh, I'm a little tired of hearing the union always saying no just to say no. Um, I'm completely in favor of flexibility. I've wanted to work a shorter week for a while already. I, I, I can see how the companies want to work their equipment less, and uh, if they have the same number of employees, you might work a few days less a month, but your days are longer, so your, your hours are almost up there. And uh, I can't see why Monroe is seeming to misrepresent these kind of facts just to keep the strike going. If he has his way, by the time the union gets all its wishes, including security, there'll be no jobs to be secure in. That's my comment. Thank you. Fair enough. But you're telling me for sure that you, the, the, the contracting out phrase now, if this were recommended, were accepted, players should not be allowed to contract out logging work beyond past and current practices. Is there anything else to keep an eye on you for that? Well, there, there isn't under that committee, although there's a recommendation that a four-man committee be established to look at exceptional circumstances. <coughs> and uh, we've said, and, and in fact have agreed many times with the IWA, that um, we, we'll bring in an umpire. Let's agree upon an umpire to deal with this. And if, <coughs> if the union feels that we're stepping out of line, let's, uh, let's have the umpire decide whether we're right or wrong. Go ahead, please. All right, I've got two questions for Mr. Bennett. I'm an IWA member in Vancouver. Um, I work in the manufacturing end of, uh, of the business, and uh, on this uh, street time on Saturdays, um, say uh, an employee is working full time at, at his 40 hours a week, and then he's asked to work on a Saturday. What happens? Are you just talking about casuals, or are you talking about um, full time employees as well? Well, a full time employee that's asked to work uh, on Saturday after he's put his 40 hours in is going to get rate right and a half. Yeah, okay. Uh, no question about that. Okay. But what we're really looking at, I, I don't think that the generally the manufacturing uh, setup that we have now, which is Monday to Friday, will change with this balancing. We will be still using uh, casuals or people that are on the spare board list or people that have been laid off. We'll be using those people to do the so-called balancing on the weekends. The only difference will be we'll be paying them straight time rate <coughs> instead of having to pay rate and a half. That, that's the only difference. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Bennett. Yes, sir. Yes, I just wanted to confirm that uh, what the last fellow asked, it seemed to have gotten missed last night. Uh, we're talking seven-hour days, ten hours a day, and I got the impression after last night's conversation that um, people would be working straight time for seven days a week. And No, uh, no. Well, that may have been my fault. It's been made perfectly clear in this that it's four, it could be four ten-hour days seven days a week, but you shifted before 10 hour days, wouldn't it? That's correct. The principle is that people will not work more than 40 hours a week on an averaging basis. Now, there may be the odd uh, occasion, I can't think of one offhand, where, in a, well, let's take the 10 and 4 shifts that are going on in logging now. This is different than the four tens. This is 10 days on, 4 days off. Now, within a two-week period, they will average 40 hours a week. But in fact, they will work seven days straight plus another three days for their 10 days on, and then they take four days off. The average is 40 hours a week. The principle established by the commission is that nobody on an averaging basis will work more than 40 hours a week, and if they do, we must pay rate right and a half. Okay. Well, the important thing is then it doesn't reduce their standard of living. Thank you very much, sir, and good luck. Certainly not. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Bennett if, uh, if I'm correct in my understanding that the plan to increase stumpage rates, et cetera, in Canada to equate to the 15% uh, tariff that's been put on by the U.S. is going to mean that Canadians are going to have to pay generally 15% more for their lumber. You're on the wrong topic. I'll have Apsy here on Thursday night. You don't, you don't want to get into that, do you? No, Mike Apsy is very, very He's the knowledgeable that in that area. Go ahead, please. Yeah, conceivably, uh, Mr. Bennett, um, on the 21 and 7 type of shift, could we work 21 10-hour days straight, and then to satisfy the 40-hour averaging period, get two weeks off? Would we go up there for three weeks and then bunk in town for two weeks? And also, I'd like to make a comment after you answer the question. I'm not sure I follow the question. You're talking about working 21 days straight? Yes, in a 21 and a 7 shift, you're working 21, 21 days straight. Now, 
and then you get the equivalent time off. That's right. Uh, uh, conceivably, uh, by this port, you, you guys could make us one, work 21, 10 hours, days straight, according to the language of the report. <coughs> now, could, to satisfy the 40 hours averaging, You'll you make us take two weeks off in town. Is that is that feasible on your part? I I imagine it could be done, but I, I can't see our people wanting to schedule uh, people to the point of exhaustion. To me, if you're working 21 days straight at 10 hours a day, your productivity is going to drop and the company's going to lose in the long run. I, I can't see a shift like that. Uh, okay, hold on. I'll take the rest of your question after the break. <laughs> How many different initiatives have been used to try and solve this? Jack, there have been six separate initiatives to try and solve this problem. Go yeah. ahead with your second question. Uh, yes, um, uh, if you're going to work a grapple yarder for a week or two weeks, 14, 15, 6, or 21, 7, you're going to work them 10 hours a day, chances are he's going to have one or two hours travel time. You're going to have a 14 or a 15, 15 day week working 12 hours a day. And that's going to burn your guys out, and uh, good luck. Well, no, again, we're not trying to burn our people out. That's not in our interests or your interests. No. Uh, I, I'm not sure the shifts that you mentioned are, are different than those that I understand. Normally it's a 10 and 4, 15 and 6, or a 20 and 8, which gives you the, the appropriate amount of time off with days worked on an averaging basis. Uh, I'm not clear on the shifts you're talking about. Go ahead from Kamloops. Yes, I was wondering how come the union contracts don't come up through uh, from uh, February to April when the interior loggers are not working? What's that got to do with that? Uh, sorry, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Uh, uh, carry on. Go on, what are you? Hello? Yes, carry on. Uh, well, I feel that there's a large people who are on unemployment who are not at issue here who are being affected. You mean they're not working? Well, yes, most of the interior logging contractors are laid off from February to say ju almost to July, how come, they're, uh, how come they're being affected by this strike? How come the contracts don't come up in the period of time from uh, February to uh, say July? Instead of in the middle of summer when people are uh, anxious maybe to go hunting or fishing in the, through the union. Well, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty with the question. I, I wish I could answer it. I do know that uh, logging contractors in the interior, which are virtually all non-union, they do work long days when the logging season is on and as my understanding is they make very good money and then uh, when there's the breakup and they can't log then uh, uh, they're quite happy to take the time off. I, I, I don't know how to answer the question of how we Fair can enough. fit the contract in. With Go ahead from Kelowna. Yes, I would just like to make a comment about to the IWA men who are listening on your show, Jack. Uh, I have been on a seven and a half month strike uh, in the interior here uh, many years ago and uh, it seems to me that I remember too when uh, we wait too long that we will be offered less yet. Uh, there was a comment about uh, uh, that we were uh, we are being offered less now than, uh, than uh, earlier and I believe that if uh, we don't get our heads on straight as IWA members and let this thing go till February or March we're going to be offered a lot less yet because we're going to be desperate to go back to work. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Well, Mr. Bennett, I'm plant chairman in Vancouver of 150 men. I'm, I'm going to implore them people to reject that settlement. I don't even see what, what the hell, what, what, that, what that commission came down with, what, why they figure we've been on strike for four months. We've been on strike for our job preservation. We don't want that 40 cents. We don't even ask for that $200. That's, and, and what's with this? Uh, we don't want to, uh, they took away the, the uh, you wanted us the contributions to something? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask our negotiating committee to put our demands back on the table, and then we'll be on strike for something. Right now, it's only job preservation. But for somebody who's in a business that's made millions of dollars to try and think of uh, doing away with one man's livelihood. Fair enough. 
Right. It's kind of speechless. There isn't any, any, there's no new job security guaranteed anybody in this uh, agreement, though, is there? Well, I guess in logging there certainly is with that restrictive language. But uh, I think that that caller should probably spend some time with his union because I think he's got a few things mixed up. We're not looking for you to put added contributions into anything. So at least before you employ your people to... Uh, to vote against it. Get, make sure you've got all the facts. Get a copy of the report and read it. Go ahead, please. Hello. I just uh, wanted to make a comment. Uh, the Commission has recommended that uh, the industry accept restrictive contracting out. I agree with that because I've seen the effects of contracting out among forestry crews on the tree farm licenses. However, I don't see the problem with the IWA working weekends, especially since the pulp industry has done it since uh, day one. I agree. Uh, it was the quid pro quo that we were seeking. You get the restrictive language, we get more flexibility. That's what this has been all about for the last two or three months. Well, you got a little bit of it. We got a little bit of it. Well, in, fl in logging, uh, we're, we're not dissatisfied. In logging, the recommended flexibility is, is, Straight time is, seven days away. is good. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah. Bennett. Sir. I'm just wondering, sir, um, on the contracting out, I'm an electrician in uh, the New Westminster local. On contracting out, would, uh, if I happen to quit my job or end up retiring from that job, will that job be passed down to an IWA employee or can it then be put out for contract? Well, it would depend on the situation. Uh, if there was a full-time, if there was a requirement for a full-time electrician at that operation, the chances are great that uh, somebody, an apprentice would move up or they would hire someone. Uh, but if there was only, a, uh, say a quarter of a job or half a job uh, left when you retired, then the company could uh, use an IWA contractor to do that work. Yes, but wasn't it uh, part of the uh, bid for, that the IWA was making is that job, which is now in existence there, would always be IWA? <laughs> well, that, that was what they were seeking. Um, but, but you just stated earlier in the program that when Mr. Webster read that out, that uh, the, we got what we wanted, and apparently we didn't. Well, you got what you wanted in logging. Well, in logging, sir, but that not in uh, not in the maintenance and no, not, you know, in, not in the manu in the manufacturing side. We said the same thing as we said in logging that if you want to put restrictive language into the contract on contracting out, that we want the quid pro quo of being able to operate our manufacturing plants on a scheduled basis six days a week. The commission rejected what we asked for, and they rejected what, what the union asked for. Okay, bye. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I basically agree with the IWA position. Um, I just want to make the comment that, uh, Jack, presumably you've got job security because you've got a contract, but the rest of us, I don't have job security. Mr. Bennett presumably doesn't have job security. You're right about that. <laughs> Jack Monroe doesn't have job security. He's an elected official. I just wanted to say to the IWA, get with it. The world is changing. And uh, let's get educated. You mean give up job security? Uh, be more flexible. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Last call. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, uh, Mr. Bennett was speaking there of the concessions given uh, and down in the states uh, with Warehouser and uh, Simpson and so on uh, for uh, lower wage contracts. But uh, if you start comparing the stumpages here to there, on a, and if you took the same uh, unit of wood, I think you'd find out that they're paying probably somewhere between four and five hundred percent more on their stumpage fees down there than they are here. Well, that's another uh, piece of the sandwich altogether, which is going to be decided on the Counterville. Uh, I don't he brought that up, though, is the fact that where they were saving money uh, down there on the lower wages, but here they've got the lower stumpage. Fair enough, but I'm leaving that alone for the moment. You'll know by Thursday where you stand on a formal acceptance of the Hudson report. Yes, we'll we know won't know until you. next week about the IWA. That's Let's correct. hope to goodness sake something happens to settle it. Right. My Thank thanks you. to Keith Bennett. Next, a change of pace. I'm going to divest myself of all civilized habits and plunge into the <coughs> bear's cave after the break. Funny, I came in today and Steve, yesterday I was, Steve Wyatt, my producer, said to me, doing another author tonight. I said, not another author, surely to goodness, not another author. And then he throws the book at me. I mean, he threw a book at me. It was The Clan of the Clave Bear and The Mammoth Hunter. 
And I read The Climb of the Cave, cave Bear. I think it was last year, the Hawaii or something. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. it just entranced me completely. Well, thank so you. So you and I must have similar instincts and both of kind of Neanderthal touches, have we? <laughs> well, I think that the Neanderthals were certainly a lot more human than we've given them credit for. Would you not rather be, Cro be Cro-Magnon than well, Neanderthal? Well, that's, of course, that's what we are. Now, a question to the woman. Jean Owl is one of the world's most successful authors. She sells more books than Michener, and you didn't even start to write until you were 40. Almost 41. And you're just a wee girl from the west coast of the United States. <laughs> That's <with Portland>. right. <laughs> Tell me what made you do it. There you were, married, kids, and all of a sudden you explode with millions of books. Well, I didn't just explode with millions of books. I really started, I was in between jobs. My kids were almost grown. I'd been going to school and working full time and doing all this stuff, and that was kind of all over. And I just got an idea for a story. And it was one of these things that was nagging at my brain all day long. And I just sat down that night and I said, I wonder if I could write a short story. Mm -hmm. And I started to do it and it was kind of fun. I'd never done it before. What was the theme of it? It was of a young woman living with people who were different, who, were, who I knew I was thinking prehistory. And I'm sure I must have picked it up someplace in my reading. After all, I was 40 years old. Mm -hmm. And she, I thought, they were different, but they'd think she was different. And she was living with an old man with a crippled arm, but they, you know, they were looking at her with some suspicion. But because she was taking care of him, they were letting her stay. And that was the first idea. And it was just a, just a situation. And then you went out to research, uh, what would you call it, prehistoric? Prehistory, Ice Age, I found out that was the period there, when there really were two different kinds of humans. And I got to the library and I discovered this whole world. And I didn't even know it has existed. And I, and it was... Came home with 50 books? Well, a couple arm loads, probably pretty close to 50. And I sat down and literally read them. And they were everything. They were Time Life coffee table books. There were, there were textbooks. There were uh, everything I could think of. And I found out that there was so much more there than we'd imagined. And I said, that's the story I want to tell. Because until I read your books, quoting yourself, I thought that my people came from a bunch of brutal, grunting savages of that era. Yeah. And you'd convinced me otherwise, did you not? Well, you see, the scientists convinced me. And the that's what was fun about it. Because, and, and it's interesting because, you know, the in, when you're talking about the archaeological record, what information is there? How do we know that they were not grunting savages? Mm. How do we know that they were not cruel and violent? Well, I'll give you one example. There was an old man that they found the skeleton of at a place called Shanadar Cave. Who was that? This yeah. was in Iraq, okay? Mm -hmm. He died in a rock fall. Evidence to the skull showed that his eye had been, his, he was probably blind in one eye. There was damage and subsequent regrowth. His arm had been amputated. He walked with a limp. Looked like he'd probably been paralyzed from an early age because there was a lot of bone atrophy, shrinkage, okay? How did that man live to be an old man? Who took care of him when he was a paralyzed kid? Why? Who mm -hmm. sliced off his arm? Who, who was able to amputate it? But uh, here you were a housewife with kids, and you write a short story, and then you went into your first big book, Clan of the Cave Bear. Well, actually, what happened was when I got back with that research material, and I got through reading it, I said, I'm not going to do a short story, I'm going to do a novel. And then I sat down at my typewriter, and I started to tell the story to myself. And it ended up and grew and grew and grew and grew, and I had this big, fat manuscript in six parts. And then I went back and reread it, and I realized I didn't have one novel. Each one of those parts was a separate novel. So the first part <laughs> became The Clan of the Cave Bear. He sold a million books, or many million have he sold. Yeah, actually, I think Clan in, in hardcover and paperback is probably about five and a half million in, in the United States and Canada. Uh, Clan uh, Valley is probably close to five million in hardcover and paperback. And The Mammoth Hunter's first printing in hardcover was a million. It, it went up subsequently to a million and a half books and two million in paperback. How does it feel to be the mother of a cult? I don't think I'm the mother of a cult. Yes, you are. <laughs> You're a cult. Jeannie Ella. You're a Jeannie Owl. Jeannie Owl. Jeannie Owl. Yes. Owl. You're a cult. Are you not? <laughs> uh, then you went, uh, you, you went on lots of uh, anthropological expeditions. Well, actually, I, I did a lot of things. I, I took 
wilderness survival classes and spent a night up on the up on the mountain and built a snow cave. And I took I took classes in Aboriginal life. You built and lived in a snow cave. No, only one night, and I was with a class. I wasn't all by myself. Oh, I'm see. not. I'm not going to be. You're you know, not that I'm not going to go freeze myself. No, you're not that stupid. Uh, I took classes in Aboriginal life skills, and I made some stone yeah. tools, and I made leather using you know squish up the brains in the bottom of a plastic bucket and work it into the hide. It's a wonderful. What was that about squishing up the brains <laughs> in the bottom of a plastic bucket? The way that the process works is you prepare the hide, uh -huh. and you take the brains of the animal, mm -hmm. and you and the teacher said everybody gets their hands in the brains, right? He said he likes to use a blender, but everybody's got to do it the the old way. And you, and you squish it up, and you make it into a sort of a, a puree, and then you add a little water, and then you put this prepared hide in it, and what happens? is that this hide changes in your hands and it gets soft and elastic and wonderful and when you get through this stiff old hairy deer hide becomes buckskin that's like velvet. And that qualifies you as a cro magnon 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 heroine. Well at least I know something about the process and so I can write about it. You're terrific, you really are. Speak to the founder of the cult. <laughs> he doesn't like to be called a cult. <laughs> How long have you been writing? I started when I was almost 41, and I'm 50 this year. I just wanted to ask your age backwards. That's you know. okay. I don't have any problems. Your calls to Jeannie. Can I call you Jeannie? You, my father used to call me Jeannie. My husband calls me Jeannie. Those are the only ones who have. I've got a very warm feeling. You may certainly call you me Jeannie. You look like Jeannie to me. <laughs> your calls to Jeannie. Prove to me there's a cult after the break. <laughs> Is the Mammoth Hunters your latest one, or is that just... That's the paperback version of the latest one. The latest yes. one. Jean Owl will be signing books tomorrow, Wednesday, at Woodward's Oak Ridge at noon, and at Save On Foods in Richmond at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. But tonight, there's going to be a free lecture at the Instructional Resource Centre at UBC at half past 7. 228-4604. That's your plug. Thank you. Now we'll take the calls. Go ahead to... To Jeannie Owl. Hi, Jack and Jeannie. Uh, first of all, Jack, there definitely is a clan or a cult. And secondly, thanks, Jean, for all the marvelous hours you've given me. Oh, thank you so much. Now, nice bye. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering how you go about getting a story published when you're, uh, you know, your first book and everything else. How would you know who to go to to get all this accomplished? Well, I have to say that I use libraries probably more than anybody I know. I use libraries for research. I use libraries to learn how to write. And when it came time to find out how to get published, I went to the library. There's several books that you can get. OK, easy enough. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, this is a good question to follow that. Uh, thank you for some wonderful books, too. I spent many good hours with you. I'm an illustrator. Uh, the main work I've been doing has been Athabascan cultural work. Um, uh, resource books, uh, for instance, covering um, artifacts, uh, way of life, um, clothing styles, hunting styles from pre-contact with the white person in Canada's north. Mm -hmm. And? It, hello? And? I'm wondering um, where you have found some of the, the best uh, research material that uh, I might follow up on. Are there particular museums in Canada which, which have uh, better displays of Athabascan artifacts from that era? I think, I think what you will find if you go to your, your museums, even your, your one here in, in Vancouver or one in Victoria or even the one in Calgary, you try to talk to somebody who is a curator with the museum. It's amazing how cooperative people at mu museums and universities are if you ask for information. Go, go ahead from Qualicum. Jack, how you doing? No bad. Uh, number one show, I want to let you know I can live without WKRP being as you're on here now. And I'm more attractive than anybody on WKRP. Well, definitely better looking than Lonnie Anderson. <laughs> anyway, uh, Gene All, I, I want to really say how much I've enjoyed your books. I've just gotten The Mammoth Hunter, and I look forward to reading it. And the, Thank uh, you. I think you're uh, probably about one of the best authoresses I've read in a long time. And uh, there is a cult. We're into it. And keep up the good work. What's the next one called? I don't have a title yet, but it should be out in a year or two. Hey, we're looking for it. Thank you very much for the time and for the... 
opportunity to talk to you. My Bye. pleasure. Will you be noisy? Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi. I had a bet with my friend Lorraine that the, the next time we saw Ayla and John Delar, she would take her back. It would be called Return to the Clan. <laughs> uh, is our uh, John Delar and Ayla ever going to go back to the Clan? I'm not telling. You're not telling? I'm not telling. Oh, that's terrible. Is that the end of this conversation? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Jack Mizell. I just wanted to extend my deepest gratitude, even though my eyes are scratchy and red right now from spending the whole weekend reading. Oh, um, thank you. I couldn't put it down. I just, I've had the, the other, the first two hardbacks have been snitched uh, by friends, and I've got a feeling this one is going to go real quick, too, because uh, it is just, it's one of the most incredible experiences. What are you talking about, the mammoth hunters? Uh, Clan of the Cave Bear and uh, Valley of the Horses. I had both in hardback. I have also mammoth hunters in hardback. Uh, clan and... It's most unusual, you know. You've got nothing but friends around here, Ginny. Isn't that wonderful? Makes me feel slightly self-conscious and awkward. <laughs> Thanks, well, anyway. I, I tell you, if you could have her on for the whole hour, it would make, make the show worth watching. <laughs> Oh, thanks a million. Well, it is already. Oh, terrific. Oh, good deal. Big deal. Go ahead, please. Hi, Jean. Love yeah. your book. Thank you. It's just wonderful. My husband and I have been arguing on who's going to read the next one, and we're on to The Mammoth Hunters, and he won. <laughs> but uh, definitely love them, and there is a cult. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's getting a bit repetitive, this, isn't it? Go ahead, please. <laughs> Hello? Oh, yes, yes, that's you. Wonderful books. Thank you very much for some good readings. I think everybody should get a hold of them. Thank you. Thank you. You're I, welcome. You're, Bye -bye. you're really quite authoritative and accurate. I have I've gotten to the place where many of the books, some, uh, very often the books are being used in universities as, t as textbook, and I think that's wonderful because if you're writing a book that, every, that people like to read, and if it's still being used in schools, then the schools are using it because it's helping to further the education. Just help me with a little piece of anthropological trivia, if you okay. don't mind. Can you tell me why the Cro-Magnons replaced the Neanderthals so abruptly 35 years ago that it seemed the new species stormed into Europe and killed its primitive cousins? Well, I think if we were to take a look at our particular continent, mm. and within a 500-year period, it started out with a Stone Age culture, and all of a sudden, here's this highly advanced technological culture on top of it. And 500 years in archaeological record is like, you know, a centimeter, right? Well, nothing. Like nothing. And would it look like we came in and totally wiped them out? Well, what's really happened is that we've assimilated them. I mean, the guy who fixes my word processor is a full-blood Cherokee. Mm -hmm. They're not gone. They have just assimilated the new culture. They, they drive cars and they watch television and they're like we are. Yeah. Go ahead, please, to Gene Owl. Hi. Um, I'm 14 and I read Climb of the Cave Bear during the summer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. And I just wanted to, to, to see your opinion on the, the movie. The movie. I thought it was great. For, uh, uh, it was a beautiful scenery. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye. Oh, just a minute. A movie was made of the Climb of the Cave Bear. Yes. And yes. you didn't like it at all. It was made up here in Canada, in Vancouver, and it was beautiful scenery. And a terrible movie. <laughs> I won't push you on that. I get the <laughs> message. I was a little bit slow on that. Too, too, too. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Is me? Yeah, you. Hello, Jeannie. Hello. Um, I haven't read your book yet, but I will. Thank you. And uh, I recently came back from a trip to Germany. There's uh, a new archaeological digging going on. Uh, I wonder if you've been there. No, no, we're not going to do archaeological diggings just on a spec basis. I want to stay with the cult. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hi, I just wanted to say that I find your book fascinating, and I wanted to know, do you think that you have a real gift for storytelling, or is it something that you can learn? Like, do you have to have a natural trait for writing books as great as these, or is it something you think you could learn through hard work? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know. I sat down with an idea to write a story, and it was fun, and I enjoyed it. And then when I got through with that first big draft, I went back and looked at it, and it was awful. So I went to the library, and I got books on how to write. But I also had a passion inside me to tell a story, and I knew that it wasn't down there on the page because I'd been yeah. a reader all my life. But and your editors helped you in your first book, surely? Actually, not too much. <coughs> not too much. But I did a lot of self-editing. 
Well, I'll keep writing them because they're just wonderful. I just love your books. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead, please. Hello, I'd just like to say that your books are fantastic. <laughs> and that the thing that I enjoy the most about them is the incredible strength of the woman that's your main character. Thank you very much. Keep writing. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, you are a kind of Betty Friedan character yourself. Your women in your books are, aren't they? Well, I think women have always been strong. I mean, look at the pioneer women who came across here. Well, whether it's matriarchy or not, when we're talking about the fact that women are the ones who have been invested by nature to to procreate the species, you know, nature doesn't do that lightly. Women are strong. <coughs> no, I believe that matriarchies exist everywhere, despite the outward appearances of whatever happens to be the system in that place. You may well be right. Go ahead, please. From Prince George. Right. Greetings, Jean. And Hello. I want to say that when I read about the little boy who died dying, I was brought to tears. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Which book was that in? That was in the third one, in the Mammoth Hunters. In the Mammoth Hunters. I haven't read that yet. I'll read it in Hawaii. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. Yes, Jack. It's Gordon here. I just want to say I enjoy your show every night. And I'd like to ask uh, Miss Owl um, how she got started and why she... Uh, We've already done that. She was a housewife. She was at home. She had kids. She had a family. She decided to write a short story. She got into it. She went out and researched, and she's the world's biggest single publishing success. Is that a good shot put in bi biography? That, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Go ahead, please, to Jeannie Owl, Clyde of the Cave Bear. I, first of all, I'd like to say I just love your books. Thank you. Could you tell me where you draw your characters from? Are they from family and friends, or...? I, I suppose they're from every place. First of all, they often are, they're suggested originally either by fossils or by the archaeological record. Uh, and then they begin to become themselves. I certainly do draw from people that I know and from people that I've, kn that I've read about. But after a while, they begin to take on their own characteristics. Sure. What about their names? Are they from actual time back then, or are they sort of made no, up? No, no, I've, I've had to invent the names. We don't really know the language they speak. No, there ain't then. no written records, no how from those days. No. Well, you so make no. it very believable. Thank you very much. So if it's John Delada, it's John Delada. It might be Gumbelard or Dardelard. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Bordelard. You know what I think? I, no. think? I think I've discovered a Cro-Magnon word. What is it? Quick. I think it's Don, D-O-N. What's it mean? It means two things. It means water and it means mother or woman. Be the first to learn along with me Cro-Magnon. Don means water, woman, and, and love. I, and, and I'll tell you why. I think we're up. Go ahead. There's a Don River in Russia. There's the Dnieper and the Dniester, which are the east and west Don. There is the Danube, which is called the Don And there's a Germany. Don in Scotland. And there's I've got to go. My time is up. Don't forget tonight the lecture, and I'll be back after the break. Well, I'm fairly exhausted after taking part in the Canucks hockey practice today. They're playing Los Angeles tonight, but I'm here with Karen Favero. Favero of the Ronald McDonald House, because the Ronald McDonald House and the Canuck Foundation are cooperating in an all-day telethon to raise money for good works. Now, what are your good works, as if I didn't know, because the Ronald McDonald House, I think, is my favorite charity. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, the Ronald McDonald House is a temporary home away from home for the parents and families of seriously ill children. The families come from out of town, um, anywhere in B.C., and stay in the house while their child's receiving treatment at Children's Hospital. So you've got to raise all the money you can. On this occasion, I believe you're splitting the money with the Canucks Foundation. Yes, we are. It's a 50-50 split. Okay, and here are the Canucks wives on the telephones raising the money for the foundation and for Ronald McDonald House. And this is? Jennifer Smeal. And this is? I would like to introduce you to Leona and her son Shelby, and they're from Merritt. Leona Marriott. Right. From Merritt. Right. Now, you wee boy stayed in the, the Ronald McDonald House. Yes, he did. We stayed there for about five months So last you went year. home and raised a lot of money, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. How much money have you raised for them to give the, to the funds today? Today, I have pledged $1,000 from the people of Merritt. My thanks to you and everybody else. And don't forget, between now and 10 p.m., hello, Shelby, phone 255-5300. And I'll see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. precisely.